Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the annual Department of Criminology Wall of Fame event. Uh, we are, as you all know, within the University of South Florida's College of Behavioral and Community Sciences. Uh, this Wall of Fame event is sponsored by Drs. Kyle and Jim Hawkins. Uh, we're very grateful to them for their generous contributions. Um, this event uh, was interrupted due to COVID, and COVID-19 has pushed us out of a face-to-face -face live event with a lunch and into this Teams event. Uh, we have gotten practice over the year in using Teams, and we're hoping this goes flawlessly. There's the outside shot. It might have some technical difficulties. Apologies in advance if that should happen. Bear with us. Uh, we owe uh, a, a deep thanks to uh, Dr. Michael Lieber, uh, who conceived of this idea. The department had always had some form or another of the um, of an awards ceremony to recognize uh, faculty, students, alumni. Uh, but Mike Lieber converted this into what we now call the Wall of Fame and converted it into more of a ceremonial thing. Uh, and, and that's really quite significant. Uh, it, it, he, in doing so, he reminded the rest of the department of the importance of recognizing and giving thanks uh, to those uh, from our ranks who have really helped make us a really significant uh, criminology department with an active role in the state, the local, as well as the, nas uh, the nation itself. So, uh, you know, Mike did that for us, and, and we need to kind of acknowledge him. We're going to get on with the award ceremony straight away. As has been in the past, we, we induct uh, alumni into our Wall of Fame. Uh, after the award ceremony is completed, we will have, uh, we have faculty uh, give a, a talk on uh, their research. This year, we're looking at the issue of human trafficking. Uh, and then we will commence. Uh, so let's get on with the awards ceremony. I will uh, shortly be turning this over to Dwayne Smith. I'd like to recognize Dwayne. Uh, he is the, you know, he is a professor of criminology, former chair of the department. He is currently the dean of the graduate uh, studies at USF, and he is the senior vice provost at the yeah. University of South Florida. Importantly, Dwayne was hired as an external chair to come into the department, and he recognized, I believe he recognized something the rest of us who were here at the time didn't see with the same kind of uh, high relief that Dwayne saw. He saw our, our talent. He saw our potential. He saw where we could go with things, and he helped us with recruiting faculty and grad students that now have us to the place we are today. Uh, uh, US News and World Report recently uh, uh, released uh, the rankings and we have moved up four spots in the rankings to the number 18 position nationally, uh, which we're extraordinarily proud of. We're one of a handful of programs at the University of South Florida to be so ranked. Uh, so, you know, Dwayne got it started uh, and, and so I will now turn the event over to Dwayne for the awards ceremony. Thank you, Dwayne. Well, thank you, Dr. Cochran, and uh, I appreciate those those warm words from you. Uh, well, we're in a very different setting than in years past, but we've come together today to recognize the contributions of our criminology alumni in this ninth annual Criminology Wall of Fame. From the ranks of our bachelor's, master's, and PhD graduates, we select alumni who have distinguished themselves by attaining the highest level of professional accomplishment while demonstrating personal integrity and character. 
We're honored to recognize their many contributions to the field of criminal justice and its professionalism. We begin with the recognition of four distinguished alumni representing each of the degree programs offered here at USF. Their names will be added to the Criminology Wall of Fame, prominently displayed in the Department of Criminology's office in the Social Science Building. Now, since we're unable to meet in person this year, each of these inductees will have a recorded video acceptance message that will be shown after they are introduced. And while being introduced, I'll be re reading and touching on some of the highlights that have led us to honor them in this manner. So, hey, let's get this show started. Our first inductee is Dr. Hang Chuan Chan, who was selected from the ranks of our PhD graduates. Dr. Chan, or Oliver, as we knew him, was a 2012 graduate, and that same year was the recipient of the 2012 Outstanding Criminology Ambassador Award. Now an Associate Professor of Criminology at City University of Hong Kong, he has received a number of early career awards to recognize his exemplary contributions to research and professional education that have helped his college and university achieve local and global distinction. It is particularly noteworthy that Oliver was granted early tenure and promoted to Associate Professor in 2017. Now, Oliver's research focuses on sexual homicide, offender profiling, sex offending, homicide, stalking behavior, and Asian criminology. He has published widely on these topics, especially in the area of sexual homicide, having over 90, and you heard it, that's 90, peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. In addition, he's published four academic books and serves as an editor associate editor or editorial board member on a number of academic journals. Oliver is regularly interviewed and quoted in the media on criminological issues. As well, he's been consulted on the offending behavior of violent offenders by television program script writers and movie producers. It's obvious Oliver was trained well to be a media star during his time at USF, having several role models to learn from. So here is Dr. Chen's acceptance video. My name is Oliver Chen, and I was graduated in the year 2012 from the doctoral program in criminology. I'm currently working at um, the City University of Hong Kong um, at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences as an associate professor of criminology. My research interest mainly lines on um, the studies of sexual homicides, um, violent sexual offending, stalking behavior, and Asian criminology. Um, my involvement at the Department of Criminology at USF um, provide me with a very good networking uh, where the departments highly encourage us to participate in different conferences, um, to get involved in different research activities, which provide, um, which allow us to, to set a very good starting point or at least a platform for us to move forward in our academic career later after we graduated from the program. Lastly, I would like to express my gratitude. I would like to thank you to the Department of Criminology at the USF um, in honoring me or, or providing me this award um, to be inducted to the War Fame for 2021. Thank you so much. Dr. Smith, you're muted. Congratulations, Dr. John. Our next distinguished alumnus, Jordan Bonas Tober, comes from the ranks of the MA program. Jordan is a policy advisor at the Office of the State Attorney in Hillsborough County. She graduated magna cum laude from the University of South Florida in 2015 with a BA in criminology. She stayed with us and earned her MA degree in criminology in 2018. While a student, Jordan served as a graduate teaching assistant under doctors Kathleen Heidi and Elizabeth Cass. Upon graduation, Jordan worked as a criminal intelligence analyst intern at the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. 
She then transitioned to the Hillsborough County State Attorney's Office, where she served as the executive assistant to the state attorney. In her current position as a policy advisor, Jordan works to translate academic research into practical strategies to address crime. Here is Ms. Bunnis Tober's acceptance video. My name is Jordan Bonas Weber. I was enrolled at the USF Masters of Criminology program, and I graduated in May of 2018. So I'm currently employed at the Hillsborough County State Attorney's Office, where I serve as the Executive Assistant and Policy Advisor to State Attorney Andrew Warren. I do everything from analyzing data and reviewing research to developing evidence-based policies and programs, um, and even coordinating special projects between my office and other community organizations. USF criminology really impacted my life and specifically my career trajectory. Um, I really benefited from expert professors who um, were totally invested in my success and that challenged me to explore different aspects of the field, even outside of academia. Um, they not only gave me confidence, but also the knowledge and tools that I would need to be successful um, in the field of criminal justice. I just want to say that I'm, I'm so proud to have been a part of the USF Department of Criminology and really honored to receive this award alongside other distinguished alumni who have made such a difference in the field of criminal justice. Um, I really want to say a special thank you to Dr. Heidi and Dr. Fox uh, for their mentorship and their support in my professional development, even outside the walls of USF. Um, I will always, always appreciate your encouragement and your guidance. So thank you both so, so much. We congratulate Ms. Bonas Tober. Our next distinguished alumni comes from the ranks of the MACJA program. Major James Mollo has served as a law enforcement officer within the state of Florida for the past 29 years, with the last 20 of those being in his hometown community of Pasco County. James has been a member of the command staff at the Pasco County Sheriff's Office for the past 10 years and has led many areas within the agency. During his career, he has worked as a police officer with the Florida State Capitol Police, special agent with the Florida Division of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco, and senior police officer with the Temple Terrace Police Department. As a consequence, he has experienced the diverse perspectives of working within state, county, and city governments. A graduate of our MACGA program in 2015, James has also received a certificate in project management from USF and a graduate certificate in criminal justice education from the University of Virginia as he simultaneously graduated from the Federal Bureau of Investigations National Academy. James is active in the community and law enforcement field, is a member of several professional and community organizations, and has served on various boards throughout his career. Let's hear from Major Malo. My name is James Mallow, a major with Pasco Sheriff's Office. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at USF in, in criminal justice um, in 1991. And then I re-enrolled uh, into the master's program uh, with, uh, with Dr. Uh, Bromley. <laughs> um, and that was uh, in 2000 and we started the program in 2013. Professionally, I'm a major with Pasco Sheriff's Office. Uh, I uh, have, uh, my, my command is Operational Logistics Bureau. Uh, so I have a lot of the back, background behind the scenes, what's new, what's coming. If you notice uh, one of the areas um, is, is fleet. I have purchasing and I also um, have IT. You know, forever, uh, since I can remember, um, and I wanted to make the world a better place or make the place that I'm at a better place from the second I get there. And so um, and helping people and, and getting through people through hard times, even if it's just 15 minutes out of their life, you can be so, you can change people's lives in those 15 minutes. I want to thank the USF College of Behavioral Health and Community Sciences uh, Department of Criminology 
it's hard to put in words how humbling it is. Um, I did take a look at all of the others, uh, including Jeff Peake, who, uh, Major Jeff Peake, that is, uh, who's also on the wall, and it just makes it that much um, more humbling. Um, Dr. Hawkins, thank you very much. Dr. Bromley, thank you very much. And um, Dr. Trito, um, I know you're you're part of this um, celebration, I'll call it. Um, and I definitely appreciate you very much and all the work you've done your, your entire life. So that's, that's what I'd like to thank. And I'd like to thank my wife, Laura Mello, for allowing me to have the time to put the effort and energy into um, such a great school and such a great program as the master's program. And we congratulate Major Mello. Our final distinguished alumni is James Bradford, and let's call him Chief James Bradford. A native of New Jersey, Jim earned his BA in criminology from USF in 1988. He then earned his law enforcement certification through the Tampa Police Academy in 1989. He's had a long career with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, rising to the rank of Colonel. But in November of 2020, Jim became the Chief of Police of the Plant City Police Department. While with the H CSO. He served in a variety of departments, including burglary, robbery, patrol, homicide, and intelligence. Jim was also a part of the transition team to bring child protective investigations on a contract basis from the Florida Department of Children and Families to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. As chief, his goal is focused on community involvement, as evidenced by his having worked with several local social service groups including the Hillsborough County Juvenile Justice Board, Hillsborough County's Blue Ribbon Committee for Child Safety, and the spring, a domestic violence shelter. So let's hear Chief Bradford's acceptance video. Thank you. We may have a problem at Chief Bradford's video, Dwayne. Well, we will congratulate him anyway, and we'll move right along because we now recognize six alumni who have been identified as outstanding ambassadors for the Department of Criminology. Each of these professionals represent the department in ways that promote and enhance our department's identity and reputation. Our first outstanding ambassador is Captain Charlie Thorpe, a graduate of the MACJA program. Charlie's home campus was USF Sarasota Manatee, where he received the Criminology Class of 2013 Outstanding Graduate Student Award. Currently a captain with the Venice Police Department, he retired as a captain from the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office in 2017 after 27 years with that agency. From 2014 through 2017, Charlie was a National Institute of Justice Law Enforcement Advancing Data and Science Scholar. He is a member of several national committees and work groups, including the International Association of Police Chiefs Patrol and Tactical Operations Committee, the IACP's Criminal Intelligence Work Group, and the National Sheriff's Association Cyber Crime Work Group. We congratulate Captain Thorpe. Our next outstanding ambassador is James Hubble. James double majored as an undergraduate at USF receiving a BS in Cell and Molecular Biology and his BA in Criminology. He's currently a first-year doctoral student at the University at Albany School of Criminal Justice. Hmm, that place sounds familiar. To date, he has one senior authored peer-reviewed publication in Behavioral Sciences and the Law and one senior authored book chapter in a forthcoming volume on child to parent homicide that is edited by leading scholars from the United Kingdom and Australia. James also has three manuscripts under review with the Journal of Quantitative Criminology, International Journal of Offender Therapy and Comparative Criminology, and Behavioral Sciences and the Law. He has also presented four papers at the American Society of Criminology meetings and one at the Homicide Research Working Group Conference, and that's a group I've definitely heard of. He's committed to the welfare of others with passion and research that is focused on making a difference in the lives of maltreated children, as well as defendants and victims 
from sexual minority groups. We congratulate James Hubble. Our next out, uh, outstanding ambassador is Daniela Omara. She is a graduate of the Criminology Master's Program. Daniela is a first generation college student who earned a bachelor's degree at the University of Florida and is now a first year doctoral student at the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. During her time at USF, she was a member of the Spruce Lab and worked alongside Drs. Rochelle Powers, Brianna Fox, and Michael Lynch. Inspired by her work at USF, Daniela's current research interests include race, ethnicity, and class disadvantages within the criminal justice system, crimes of the powerful, and prosecutorial discretion. We congratulate Danielle. The next outstanding ambassador is Lieutenant Martin King, a graduate of the MACJA program. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from crimin in criminology from USF. Additionally, Marty has received graduate certificates from USF and the University of Louisville. And he's also a graduate of the Southern Police Institute's 141st Administrative Officers course in Louisville, Kentucky. Marty has served the University of South Florida as a police officer since 2000, during which time he has worked in a variety of assignments. In March 2014, he was promoted to Lieutenant and assigned to the Special Operations Division, where he was responsible for managing special events and overseeing the Criminal Investigation and Community Outreach and Enforcement Section. He is currently the Commanding Officer of the Patrol Division that includes civilian community service officers. Marty has received the Meritorious Life Saving Award in 2001, as well as additional commendations throughout his career for his service and dedication to the USF community. We extend to him our heartiest congratulations. Our next outstanding ambassador is Dr. Chris J. Mayer, who is a graduate of our PhD program. Chris is now an assistant professor of criminal justice and senior policing scholar at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. His teaching and research focus on policing, race, and cross-national examinations of criminal justice. Prior to earning his PhD, Chris worked in law enforcement, including assignments as a patrol officer and a school resource officer. He's a recipient of the University of South Florida's Graduate Fellowship Award and the ACJS International Section's Outstanding Graduate Student Paper. Chris's research has been published in Criminology and Public Policy, the American Journal of Criminal Justice, and Race and Justice. Our best congratulations to you. Our final outstanding ambassador is Dr. Rachel Severson, also a graduate of our PhD program, having reserved her degree in 2020 under the mentorship of Dr. Rochelle Powers. Being this fall, Rachel will be an assistant professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Tampa. Prior to USF, she earned her MED in clinical mental health counseling at Lynchburg College and worked in inpatient psychiatric units in Lynchburg, Virginia. Drawing on her prior experience, Rachel's research is centered around the impact of mental health among individuals involved in the justice system with a specific focus on experiences with imprisonment. Her work has been published in several scholarly journals, including Criminal Justice and Behavior and Crime and Delinquency. While at USF, she served as a writing coach and program assistant for the MACJA program, president and vice president of CGSO, and taught several graduate and undergraduate courses. We extend our most hearty congratulations to you. Well, that's it, folks. If I were here there in person, I would call on us to engage in a rousing, boisterous round of applause for all of our uh, on today's honorees. Well, heck, let's do it anyway. Awardees, use your imagination. This is the one time it's okay for you to be hearing things. So, in closing, let me just say that it's been an honor for me to take part in this ceremony since its inception. Beyond that, though, I really want you to know 
that the department has really been an important part of my life for 20 years now. And about half of the faculty are sitting there right now saying, has it really been 20 years? Well, do the math, fall 2000. Yeah, folks, it's been 20 years. I am so proud of the accomplishments of our faculty, students, and our alumni. So let us look forward to this next year in which we continue the upper trajectory that we've been on, and we look forward next year to perhaps doing this in person so Wall of Fame number 10 can be one where we all get back together. For now, I bid you farewell and turn the speaker platform back to Dr. Cochran. Thank you, Dwayne. I uh, really do appreciate the job you do for us every year uh, introducing our Wall of Fame inductees. They do a great job of it. Um, I'd like to congratulate each of these inductees. Again, thanking you for how well you represent the department. It's, it's always a, a great opportunity to honor you folks. We look forward to the next year's class as well and hope we see you uh, at that Wall of Fame induction ceremony when we hold it. Um, now we are turning it over to the Hawkins Community Partnership Award. I will ask uh, Carl Hawkins to uh, make that introduction, but please allow me to first introduce Carl. Uh, Carl Hawkins retired in 2009 as a Colonel of the Department of Administrative Services with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office here in Tampa, Florida. He has nearly 35 years of law enforcement experience with HCSO and doing so working in almost all of the organization's uh, uh, operational administrative assignments. In 1992, he was selected by the Police Executive Research Forum, we know it as PERF, to be part of a two-year research study on how community policing was operating throughout North America. This led to his publication, Ready, Fire, Aim, a look at community policing in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, that's been published and republished in a number of books on community policing. He was awarded the Community Policing Fellowship in 1996 to the National Center for State, Local, and International Law Enforcement Training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. During the fellowship, he conducted research and developed the Small Town and Rural Community Policing Train the Trainer program offered at over 30 locations throughout the United States. He worked for PERF in Washington, D.C. as a senior associate in 2009 and 2010 uh, leaving the latter part of 2010 to open his own public safety consulting business. While at PERF, he was involved in a number of management assessment studies of police and sheriff's departments throughout the United States, including an evaluation of civilians in law enforcement. In 2009, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Award from the Department of Criminology at USF. Uh, in 2012, he received the Distinguished Alumni Award and was selected to our inaugural Wall of Fame class uh, in the Department of Criminology. Dr. Hawkins earned his Doctor of Public Administration's degree in 1982 and a Master's of Science in Criminal Justice in 1997 from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. He also earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Criminal Justice in 1974 from the University of South Florida. He's a graduate of the 18th session of the Senior Management Institute for, uh, for Police at PERF, the 76th Administrative Officers course of the Southern Police Institute at the University of Louisiana, and the 77th Delinquency Control course of the Delinquency Control Institute at the University of Southern California. Carl has 37 years of college university teaching experience, of which the uh, last 25 have been here at USF. He has published 11 journal articles, eight book chapters, 12 management studies, uh, two federal uh, grant uh, government reports. Uh, he has developed and been involved in nine federal grants awarded in excess of over $7 million. That's the record of a uh, tenured full professor at USF. Carl, what happened? We, we never hired you. We should have. Uh, and of course, Dr. Hawkins continues to provide uh, public safety and consultancy services throughout the state of Florida. Carl, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cochran. I appreciate the, the introduction. 
Uh, good morning. On behalf of my wife and I, Cynthia, we would like to congratulate and present the 2021 Hawkins Community Partnership Award to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Among the many things the Sheriff's Office has done in their community, partnership efforts, uh, here are a few of their highlights. Number one, they created a veterans resurgence program in the county jail to help reduce recidivism among military veterans through an eight week mental health therapy session and a career development training. Secondly, the USF Masters of Social Work graduate interns assist in that program, provide uh, and assist with a mental health counselor uh, in their therapy sessions, and that is extends into career advice, money management, and conflict resolution. USF Criminology Department is involved and evaluate this, this particular program. They also supported USF Criminology grant request regarding law enforcement mental health issues, and they created a USF recruitment video for the Master of Arts in Criminal Justice Administration program that is shown to their employees. A number of the sheriff's graduates um, employees have graduated from the Master of Arts in Criminal Justice Administration program, including a sheriff's deputy who will graduate next month and three considering enrollment in the new cohort starting in August. We want to thank the men and women of the sheriff's office for the community partnerships with USF and our local community. And now let me introduce Chief Deputy Donna Lazinski, who will accept this award. I'm Chief Deputy Donna Lazinski, and I'm representing the men and women of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. There's a number of programs that we're involved with with USF. Uh, the first and right now, the most important is our Veterans Resurgence Program. And that's a program where if any veterans are arrested and come into our facility, uh, we work closely with USF and other providers to make sure that they get mental health counseling, drug treatment, provide any services that may prevent them from coming back into the criminal justice system. Our vets are very important to us and have served our country. So we want to make sure we're trying to give them the best opportunity possible. And USF is helping us evaluate those programs to see if we're doing good on the processes that we have in place or if it's something we need to improve or add additional services. I'd like to take a minute to thank Dr. Bromley uh, as well as Dr. Kimberly. Um, and the other support staff that are out there at USF. Um, the relationship we have developed over the years helps us both be successful. Um, having such a fine institution associated with our office, again, gives us a greater view of credibility with the public, and it affords our deputies and our employees to be better informed. Um, so the staff there that work tirelessly day in, day out, because they haven't stopped as well. Well, we're particularly going through COVID, so we know they've continually reached out to us, and we appreciate that. So thank you to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office for uh, all the work you do with us uh, at the University of South Florida in the Department of Criminology. Uh, we have enjoyed a long, strong, and enduring relationship with the HCSO and are very much looking forward to continuing that into a deep future. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to have you as one of our many uh, local partners. Uh, at this point, um, it's time to congratulate all of our inductees once again, and, and as well as our community partner, uh, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. And we can now uh, move toward uh, uh, our, our guest speakers. Uh, before doing so, I would one like to thank again the HCSO and Carl Hawkins for introducing them and sponsoring the award. And now I will introduce uh, Lee Burkaw, uh, who will in turn introduce our speakers on uh, human trafficking. Assistant Chief Lee Burkaw joined the Tampa Police Department in 1997 currently serving as the Assistant Chief of Operations overseeing the patrol divisions. During his 24 years at the TPD, Assistant Chief Burkaw has worked in all three patrol divisions, the Criminal Investigations Division, and the Internal Affairs Unit. During his tenure in Internal Affairs, he established the Department's Professional Standards Bureau and launched the Department's Quality Assurance Program. Under his direction, the department achieved their initial accreditation through the Commission for Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation. Assistant Chief Burkaw has become known for his proactive crime reduction initiatives and his management of large-scale events 
in security and transportation for the Super Bowl, the Republican National Convention, the International Indian Film Festival, we know that as Bollywood, uh, Gasparilla, and the NC, uh, the National uh, Football uh, National Championships, College Football National Championships. Sorry. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Criminology and a Master's of Arts in Criminal Justice Administration from USF, go Bulls, in 2016. Uh, Assistant Chief uh, Burka was honored by the Department of Criminology uh, by being named to our Wall of Fame as an Outstanding Criminology Ambassador. Assistant Chief Burka graduated from the prestigious Senior Management Institute for Police hosted by uh, the Police Executive Research Forum in Boston. Uh, he is also an alumnus of the esteemed Leadership uh, Tampa program. He is a board member of the Tampa Bay Area Chiefs of Police Education Research Foundation, raises money for scholarships and to advance law enforcement training. Uh, he is, excuse me, I lost my place. He is currently enrolled at the St. Leo University Doctoral Program in Criminal Justice, set to graduate in December of 2021. Congratulations, Lee. Uh, his primary concentration study is human trafficking at large scale events. He also serves as a member of the Commission on Human Trafficking, as well as serving on the Executive Steering Committee for the Super Bowl, uh, overseeing the Human Trafficking Subcommittee. Uh, he is, he wants to let us know, as we all would understand, that he is extremely grateful for his wife, Kelly, his son, Christopher, his daughter, Alyssa, uh, for their love and support throughout his career in law enforcement. Thank you, Lee. I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cochran. And it's my honor to be here today and be a part of such a great event. As a practitioner and an academic, I firmly believe that events like these bring together our two disciplines through networking and collaborating on sound evidence-based principles, which ultimately improve our efficiency and effectiveness. Most importantly, this partnership reduces victims and increases our safety and wellness. Our two distinguished speakers today have provided invaluable evidence-based data, analysis, and support in combating the horrific crime of human trafficking. As you mentioned, in pursuit of my doctorate degree, I have studied extensively on the phenomenon of human trafficking at large scale events. So it's therefore my distinct honor to be introducing both the speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Joan Reed. She is the director of the USF Trafficking in Persons Risk to Resilience Research Lab and Data Depository located at the USF St. Petersburg campus. Dr. Reed and her collaborators are working to transform Tampa Bay from a region characterized by a high risk for human trafficking to a, re a region of resilience by linking and leveraging the expertise of interdisciplinary researchers across the three USF campuses and strong community partnerships to address the problem of human trafficking. Dr. Reed has authored over 65 publications featured in prominent journals to include the American Journal of Public Health, Annals of Internal Medicine, Justice Quarterly, and Sexual Abuse, with more than 50 chiefly focused on sex trafficking of girls and boys in the United States. The impact of her research is extensive, impacting practice on both a regional level and cited as guidance in human trafficking cases in various state Supreme Courts and in the U.S. Supreme Court case, Jane Doe versus Backpage. As a licensed mental health counselor, Dr. Reed has experience providing trauma therapy to rape, sexual abuse, and human trafficking survivors. Dr. Reed received her master's degree in rehabilitation and mental health counseling and PhD in criminology from the University of South Florida. So Dr. Reed, the floor is all yours. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you all for being here and for your interest and concern about the problem of human trafficking. And today, um, as you know, if you're watching the news, there's a lot of 
um, conspiracies and myths swirling around about child sex trafficking. We could start with Pizzagate or and go on to Wayfair Gate. Um, and today, the purpose of my um, presentation is to take on some of the common myths about child sex trafficking and to pair those myths with the empirical reality of, of child sex trafficking. Next. So um, today I will kind of hit on six of the most common myths of child sex trafficking. And of course, um, these aren't all of them, but I, I, these are the ones that I've most commonly encountered as a researcher since I began um, investigating child sex trafficking in the state of Florida in 2008. I left off the first myth I encountered, uh, which was that doesn't happen here because we all know um, that myth's dead. Next. So the first myth um, that I, we encounter commonly in our research is that child sex trafficking is a victimless crime. And I think this myth is partly a product of people's attitudes towards selling sex as kind of inevitable when we hear that the quote, you know, this is the world's oldest profession. Also, we it's very popular right now to think about sex work as a legitimate career. And I think people take this these attitudes one small step forward further and apply it to minors. Next. Um, so I just wanted to share with you a summary of the commonly observed consequences of child sex trafficking, and you'll see pretty quickly that it is not a victimless crime. So if we start with physical injuries, um, including sexually transmitted infections, uh, teen pregnancy, pelvic inflammatory disease, I won't read them all, I'll just kind of read a few of them, um, broken bones and wounds, and all of these short-term um, health problems lead to long-term health issues, including infertility, substance use addiction, drug overdose, and death. There's also psychological harm that comes from child sex trafficking. The most commonly noted are dissociative disorders and PTSD, um, but there's others also here. And also um, uh, survivors often have um, suicidal behavior, feelings of inferiority, self-blame, guilt, um, primarily because of the guilt that they feel about their involvement and somehow blaming themselves. And they also have issues um, in their abilities to trust others. And this is all linked to the social impairments that they face, which are uh, marginalization, criminalization, behavioral problems. And then as their children, they pull, they're pulled out of school during this exploitation, which leads to their lack of education. They often don't have a college, uh, a high school diploma which leads to their problems with, un with unemployment. And um, this, these all kind of collude together and result in a high likelihood of their involvement in adult prostitution. Next. The second myth that I wanted to talk about is really, um, I'm kind of cheating here. This is really three myths wrapped into one. <laughs> and so you kind of have to bear with me a little bit as I contend with them all and kind of show you the um, empirical reality of child sex trafficking. So myth number two is that kids freely choose child sex trafficking because it's an exciting, glamorous life with lots of money uh, available, especially to kids who don't have any money. Um, next. So first, I want to just talk to you about the age of onset or entry um, into exploitation and child sex trafficking. and. So with girls, we found that the age range is from four years old to 17 years old. The mean um, age in the research sets, the data sets that I have, is 14 years of age. Um, with boys, um, there's less available information, but again, the age range from 11 to 17, with the average age of entry being around 14 years of age. So if you think about the power differential, between a 14-year-old girl and boy and an adult actors in the commercial sex industry, and think about the developmental um, adolescent development stage of the adolescent brain, the idea that kids have power to choose kind of loses its meaning. Next. So also as um, I have, um, thanks to 
community partners that we were just discussing, I have gathered over 100, maybe 150 child sex trafficking case files. And I have noticed there's com common triggering events. And I wanna take this moment to pause as an academic and give my trigger warning because the empirical reality of child sex trafficking is pretty dark and bleak and it can be triggering. Next. So from the, these case files, I found that rape is one of the most common triggers for uh, elevated victimization in child sex trafficking. Um, the kids may be raped at home or in foster care, at school, um, or near school with school kids involved. Um, they're raped when they're skipping school or running away, and often they run away after being raped. So that is probably one of the most common, the common triggering event for child sex trafficking. Next. And when I began uh, researching um, child sex trafficking, perhaps maybe because I'm a parent, I was a parent of teenagers at the time, um, one of my first questions was how, literally how does this happen? Um, how does a kid become a victim of child sex trafficking in a very practical sense? Like what, you know, what are the steps? And if we break down the process into a crime script, what traffickers follow, um, I think we can get a better idea of how this actually happens. And the first step in the crime script for the trafficker is to find a victim. And again, um, this is from Florida child sex trafficking cases from Miami to and Tampa area. And if I have, um, um, if they're, you can hardly see, but I have them marked as, <laughs> not really sure why those are kind of small, but they're marked as many, if it's 20 or more cases, some if it's 10 to 19 cases, and few if, if it was less than nine cases. So um, many um, is that they usually drive around to find youth where they hang out, bus stops, smalls, group homes. They find um, girls in chat rooms or social media sites. Also, drug dealers will um, exploit a girl who can't pay for her drugs to pay off her debt. Um, one of the most common ways that victims are found is in foster care. Uh, one foster care girl will recruit another one, or literally the foster care staff will recruit the girls. They use peer recruiting in schools, and some, um, some uh, children are trafficked by their own parents. So that, that's pretty easy for them to find them. Next. So the next step in the process of crimes of child sex trafficking is to groom the child so that they become dependent on the trafficker. And so it's kind of you know interesting, how does this happen? How does a trafficker gr groom a victim and pull them into dependence on them so that they're able to exploit them? So many, in many cases, there's um, the trafficker will profess to love them, explicitly treat them as a grown up, show off wealth, take them to Disney or Bush Gardens or give them something they've never had. And you have to think about the backgrounds of most of these um, girls and um, that, you know, most of them are from foster care. No one's ever treated them very well. They've never been to Bush Gardens or, or to Disney. And so to be treated in this way is, is highly effective. They also build trust. They offer them to help them with whatever problem they have. They normalize sex. They ask the girl about their sexual experiences, preferences. They have sex with her. And in that process, they film and take photos. They expose them to pornographic materials. Um, and then uh, another part of the grooming process is to isolate and intimidate. They insult and undermine all their friends and family. This is you know, a, a way to isolate them. They take them to unfamiliar places. They often take them out of their town into a new place they've never been, so they have no idea how to get out or home. Um, they slap, insult, and make threats to the girls to hurt her family, her and her family. They may disorient the girls in many cases. They give them drugs or alcohol, and they switch abruptly from very kind to very cruel treatment, which leaves the girls kind of in this state of shock. Um, and then with family traffickers, they teach them the rules of the game and kind of um, family norms. Next. So the next stage in the traffickers script is to ensnare them. And this is um, how 
this kind of answers the question of how does the trafficker keep them from leaving? So once they're exploiting them, how do they keep them from getting out of that situation and getting help? And one of the first ways is by shaming, blackmailing them. So they've gone from the grooming process, which included telling them you're wonderful, you're beautiful, you're my soulmate, we'll, I'll never find anyone else like you, to the next stage of convincing them that no one else will have them, that they're, they're trash, that they can do nothing else and blackmail them with those photos and videos that they were taking. They also make them feel obligated, um, convince them that they saved them from you know, a worse situation that you don't, and that they need to be loyal and not to be a, a snitch. Uh, one thing that is common in the files that I did not expect was they make them complicit in crime. And so they um, force the girls to assist them in controlling, abusing and recruiting other girls. And then they're able to um, make that threat that if you turn on me, if you turn me in, you're just as guilty as I am, you're going to go to jail, you're going to be charged with sex trafficking, which often does happen. Um, with some of the girls, they become pregnant, and then the child, similar to a domestic violence situation, the child becomes a pawn. And so they're told, you know, you're not going to see your kid if you don't earn this much money, or uh, worse yet, you know, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to turn your kid over to DCF. You're going to lose your child, um, and you know, the, you're a, you're such a bad mom. They're going to take your kid from you. Um, they also isolate them, take away their phone, change the number. They don't necessarily shut down their social media sites, but they change the password, and so the girl no longer has control over what's posted and what and um, in order to you know keep connections. Um, they hold them against their will, and it's not like we, you would imagine or you see sometimes in pictures of human trafficking. It's not with chains or bars, but it's with the things that we go to Home Depot and buy, the home security systems that are very popular now. So those home security systems keep the girls in control because there's a video on them at all the time. They can tell alarm goes off when the windows or doors are opened, and they also use GPS devices to keep track of them. Um, they keep financial control, they keep um, all or most of the money, they control their possessions, they put them in um, kind of this feeling of debt bondage, I've spent all this money on you, now you have to pay, pay me back. Um, one another thing I wasn't expecting in the files was they not only control money and possessions, but they control food. And so if the girl doesn't earn money, she doesn't get to eat. Um, so they'll be go, they'll go out to McDonald's and everyone who's earned money that day will get their meal, but not not the teenager who didn't. Um, they'll also intimidate them, routinely beat, injure, tattoo, burn, rape, force them to watch and assist with rape. Um, they threaten to harm them again to um, they threaten them with harm to get them arrested, to get them kicked out, to abandon them and to return them to foster care where they left. And all this kind of colludes together to create a psychological bond, a dysfunctional bond that we often refer to as a trauma bond, where the girl feels like no one else will ever understand them um, and what they've been through. And so they feel like they have nowhere else to go. I hope I've answered that myth about um, kids choosing. And I also want to mention, I, I keep saying girls, um, because the case files that I have um, of, of the 100 almost 200 case files that I have, there's only one or two boys that are in these case files. And so, although um, I think that's attributable to the point that um, they're just not being um, detected and identified in the, out in the, um, among practitioners or criminal justice system. So that leads to our next myth. Next. So the next myth is that boys aren't victims. And this is really, I'm cheating again, this is really two myths in one. One, uh, the first one, for the first one, you put the emphasis on the word boys. Boys aren't victims. Next. So while I just told you that there's very few boys in my case files, when you look at uh, large surveys or large samples and you ask boys to self-report, they re it's the same exact percentage. And so in self-report, we're finding that boys are, you know, are as, as prevalent in the samples as girls are. They just aren't being detected or identified. So the next myth is that boys aren't victims. So, 
So again, we can look at, go ahead and open that up. Um, so we can look at the age again of entry that I've already mentioned, 11 to 16 years of age, 14 being the average. And also in the research that I have that combines male and female um, child sex trafficking victims, I'll just give you an example. The odds of child sex trafficking was two and a half times greater for girls who experienced sexual abuse, but there was an eight times greater risk for boys who had histories of sexual abuse. And go ahead and next. The other risks for boys in child sex trafficking included um, caregiver strain, failed nurturing, and psychological symptoms. Specifically, um, one of the high um, symptoms was psychoticism, which reflects a really high level of self social alienation. So this is more reflective of boys being victims um, rather than, um, as I've been told, maybe they're just players and having a good time getting paid for sex. If I told you which child abuse researcher, well-known child abuse researcher argued that point with me, you would be in shock. So um, next. So um, myth number four is these are really, really, really bad kids. <laughs> and this is probably the most common argument I've heard from criminologists. And, um, but I think I've managed to convince many of them that these aren't really bad kids. They aren't, they, some of the labels that you see in the files are, you know, incorrigible, promiscuous, um, problem youth. And um, so let's look ahead, go ahead next. So this is some research that I did using data from the Department, Florida Department of Juvenile Justice. So this was um, a sample of uh, 913 um, youth who were in um, juvenile justice care um, who had um, history of um, human trafficking reported reports compared with a match sample of youth who did not have um, human trafficking report. And you can see that on all the abuse items, the youth with human trafficking um, had higher levels of abuse. And so I, I would argue that they aren't really, really bad kids because we know this human trafficking, this um, group of juvenile justice youth, they're highly abused, right? Just in general. And within that, that group was even um, had higher abuse than the juvenile justice youth. Next. And then if we look at their offenses and health risk behaviors, we can quickly see that they were less likely to use a weapon, less likely to have a history of violence, less likely to have more than one um, adjudication on a misdemeanor, but they had higher drug use, suicide ideation and attempts and chronic running away. So again, um, they're troubled youth with high um, you know, levels of trauma and abuse in their lives but they're mo more likely to internalize that and to harm themselves than they are to externalize it and harm others. Next. So the, uh, the next myth is that kids aren't trafficked by family. And in the case files that I have, and it has been confirmed with other researchers, about 30% of kids are trafficked by family members, with mothers being the most common family trafficker, um, either working um, for money, um, as a madam or they have a really uh, serious drug addiction and they're using, selling their children um, to get drugs. Um, or the mother themselves is a prostitute and is a mentor for their um, child. Also fathers, other ma male relatives, and sometimes there is more than one male relative. So children are trafficked by their families. Next. Also just mentioned real quickly, there's ex the most extreme levels of abuse around, among the kids that were trafficked by family, um, where with almost, you know, 88% had been sexually abused, neglect, abandonment, and many of them had um, experienced all forms of maltreatment. Next. All right, so my last myth is that, um, <laughs> is this probably my, I don't know what to call it, a hot button for me? is um, this popular way to make light of the harm of um, child sex trafficking or illegal forced prostitution and to kind of engender um, sympathy for the buyers is to say that buyers are primarily seeking to buy the girlfriend experience, right? Um, to get their emotional needs fed. It's really not about sex. But in my research on underage girls in Florida, I found that one third 
were, who were exploited in sex trafficking had an intellectual disability. Um, next. Um, and that was, I compared um, both across Tampa and Miami. I thought, first I saw it in Miami and I thought, what is wrong with these people in Miami? You know, that they're buying sex with girls who have intellectual disability. And then I um, looked through the Tampa cases and found the same um, percentage. And you can read there, you know, the descriptions. Most of these girls had, um, the, they may have been biologically 14 or 15 years old, but they were, had the intellect of a seven to 10 year old. They weren't really capable of protecting themselves. Um, they had very limited or no understanding of sexual or romantic relationships and didn't understand the difference between a John, a trafficker and a boyfriend. Um, also, they would have no idea that they were in dangerous situations um, and they felt unable because of their intellectual disability. They didn't feel like they had the ability to say no or to they just were, would go along with whatever they were told to do. So that, that's um, I, I kind of want to ask if that's what it, a girlfriend experience is for these buyers and it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so that's the end of my myth busting for today, um, but I'd like to move on and talk a little bit just for a minute about the new research lab that we have. As you all know, um, Florida is a hot spot for human trafficking, and because of that, next, because of that last year, um, the USF Strategic Investment Award funded the initiation of the USF Trafficking Persons uh, Research Lab and Data Depository. And the purpose of this lab is to join, um, to kind of create a synergy among their, the researchers across all three campuses who were independently doing research on human trafficking. And so we want to bring those researchers together to create, um, to be able to join together to use all of our expertise to combat human trafficking. Next. So this is kind of what we do. Um, so we are also have quite a few graduate students are involved in the lab. And so we want to dedicate our skills and knowledge toward eradicating human trafficking first in our own community and then um, beyond. So we do that through knowledge building or researching by um, to address the huge knowledge gaps that exist currently um, to inform human trafficking pre prevention and intervention. Once we have that knowledge, we want to share it effectively so that we can um, help our partners in the community. And we also want to provide resources for the Tampa Bay community and key stakeholders through the establishment of a data depository. Um, it may be hard to believe, but there is no united our unified um, data set um, for the Tampa Bay area or the state of Florida for human trafficking. So that's a, a big goal of ours. Next. And uh, we also bring uh, human trafficking awareness. As, you, as I mentioned, there's all these myths about child sex trafficking and human trafficking that swirl around our community. And so every chance we, we take, every chance we have, we take to um, bring you know, empirical reality to the problem of human trafficking. Next. And although the lab is only uh, less a year old, barely, um, we have numerous projects going on that you can see, and they're led by faculty um, from the criminology department from all three um, campuses. And some of these are funded, some of these are seeking funds, some of these we have grants out trying to seek funds for these um, projects. but. Um, we're super excited. I can't believe how much we've gotten accomplished in such a short time, um, despite COVID and all the other issues that we faced. Next. And last but not least, I want to um, recognize that we have quite a few graduate students working in the research lab. We have pictured here um, Jennifer Diaz and Sarah Franklin, who are both in the Department of Criminology. And we also have research um, students researching who are in psychology and rehabilitation and mental health counseling. And there's a few that aren't pictured here and we really appreciate all the work they do. We wouldn't be able to, to work on all those projects without them. So thank you. I hope you have some questions for me later. I'm gonna turn that back over to, to Lee, I believe. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, your research and presentations have impacted not only the region, but our nation on mitigating this horrific crime. And your efforts in establishing the Traffic and Persons Lab will only burgeon these efforts. So I know personally just the amount of information you've put out has assisted me greatly and the uh, Bay Area law enforcement. Unfortunately, all those myths that you listed there, it, we see happening and it's uh, it's something that we definitely need to keep our focus on. So I appreciate your efforts. I wanted to take a quick moment to make an announcement in reference to the question and answer session. I'm being told the chat feature is not currently working, so we're requesting that you send your questions um, by email to Amanda and her email is highlighted currently on the screen. So we'll give you a minute to write that down. OK, our next speaker is not only a renowned author, but also a friend and a mentor. It was his mentoring and guidance which persuaded me to pursue my doctorate and ultimately narrow my dissertation topic. Dr. Leonard Torito is the professor emeritus in the Department of Criminology at the University of South Florida and was previously distinguished professor of criminal justice at St. Leo University. While serving with St. Leo, he created and taught a university course for nine years titled International Sex Trafficking of Women and Children. He also served as both an instructor and coordinator in the training of hundreds of in-service police officers at St. Leo University each summer for four years in a course titled Human Trafficking, The Realities of Modern Day Slavery. He's written three, bo uh, three books on the topic of human trafficking, International Sex Trafficking of Women and Children, Understanding the Global Epidemic, Criminal Investigations of Sex Trafficking in America, and The International Trafficking of Human Organs, a Multidisciplinary Perspective. Dr. Torito also served as the Chief Deputy with the Leon County Sheriff's Office. He also served for nine years with the Tampa Police Department and had assignments as a patrol officer, motorcycle officer, homicide, rape, and robbery detective, internal affairs detective, and member of the police academy training staff. Dr. Torito was recently honored by Chief Brian Dugan for his previous and ongoing support to the members of the Tampa Police Department. Dr. Torito is the former chairman of the Tampa Police, I'm sorry, Dr. Torito is the former chairman of the Department of Public Administration, uh, Police Administration, and director of Florida Institute for Law Enforcement at the St. Petersburg College. So uh, Dr. Torito, I appreciate all that you've done to uh, contribute to this horrific crime as well, and we're looking forward to your presentation. So the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind comments. My, my interest in, in the, the topic of uh, human trafficking uh, started about, about 12 years ago. And uh, when I first became familiar with it, I, want, I, I, I thought it was an, an opportunity to begin to introduce this topic to our students at St. Leo University, along with perhaps starting some, some training. Fortunately, I had a good friend of mine, Barry Glover, who had a close relationship with the uh, Clearwater Police Department, and they had a uh, human trafficking task force in the area. So I, I sort of hooked, hooked up with them, and I started becoming familiar with the, with the topic. Uh, as a result of that familiarization, uh, I created the two classes at, uh, at St. Leo University. The first, Human Trafficking of, of Women and Children Internationally, and the second was Criminal in Investigation. What, what I, and by the way, I, I broke those down because I, I kind of had this philosophy of, of bifurcating uh, education and training. It's an artificial bifurcation, but in one of courses, in much of it, the research it is typically done in a theoretical, even though it's somewhat applied nature, this is the work that fine work that Dr. Reed has done, but I also wanted to get practitioners in the in the classes. Uh, su surprisingly to me, when when I offered the, the the training course, by the way, which was done in conjunction with the uh, St. Petersburg College Regional Training Institute, uh, I found that most of my students in there, many of whom were police officers, along with people from NGOs, knew very little about the topic. Interestingly. I had a, a vice squad officer from the LAPD in charge of it, 
who traveled to Florida to attend this course and said that he had arrested over 3,000 prostitutes and until he took this course had never considered that, that they were in fact being trafficked. So it was a, a real education for, for me. Anyway, as you as you some of you are aware of, the University of South Florida uh, a number of years ago was also involved with trying to develop a human trafficking institute. And the, the collective efforts of the faculty resulted in identifying a number of subjects. And, and by the way, uh, it's very clear to me that this is a multidisciplinary approach. Unless you focus on more than, for example, exclusively law enforcement, et cetera, you're going to have big problems. So they've identified six six areas, essentially. The first one was the criminal justice professionals, which is what I consider to be the tip of the spear, law enforcement, judges and prosecutors. There's also service, and I'm just going to touch on this stuff. There are long lists, which I, I can provide if you want them. Service delivery professionals, which include the center crisis center employees and volunteers. Let me give you an example. When a police department is getting ready to conduct a raid, which involves multiple victims, one of the things they have to do is they have to work very carefully with the, with the agency that's going to be receiving these young women. I never thought about it until I actually had this training course and I had people from these NGOs. And, and Lee, Lee will know this better than most of us. You simply cannot go out there, conduct a raid, rescue 15 or 20 young girls, and then find a place to put them. You have to have some place that is provided with all the necessary medical care, mental counseling, uh, legal issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very obvious to me that this is not simply a, you know, a one a one trick pony. You have to involve lots of others. Public schools, which of course are another one, that includes your school resource offices. As a matter of fact, uh, schools are a major target for human traffickers today. So you've got to educate the entire cast of characters at schools, school resource offices, teaching and teaching assistants, guidance counselors, school administrators, members of the school board, school nurses, school psychologists, parents, students, et cetera. You get, you get the picture. And by the way, lots and lots of work is now being done in the Tampa Bay area regarding, uh, regarding the, the uh, training of personnel in the schools. Next one is the hospitality industry. I know Lee, you were ready for the Super Bowl recently, and hotels are a big target. What typically happens during these type of these uh, uh, sporting events, where especially they're involved, lots of men coming to town, uh, you know, these these guys will bring these pimps will bring in these young girls and prostitute them in hotels, etc. So, so you want to, you want to be sure your your hotels are also very much alert to what's going on to the, and work with your local police department. Another one is, is transportation, where you've got, the, for example, truckers that are working, at, at these, they're, they're filling up these local big filling stations, et cetera, et cetera. You have prostitutes that are working there. Uh, also in, in terms of travel agents, uh, travel agents in the, in the past many times have been involved in facilitating the sex trafficking, especially child sex trafficking around the world. There are now penalties against that. The last one are the healthcare professionals, uh, which deals with emergency room personnel, public nurses, pediatricians, etc. Now, on, on to the, the research subject. When I was starting to gather new, newer articles from my most recent anthology on international sex trafficking, what, what I wanted to do was to try to get more information that was applied in nature. That's not my training aspect, because I knew that the book would be read not only by academicians, but also people who are actually out there doing, doing the work. So I contacted a number of friends of mine who I knew were doing work in the area. One in particular I knew from, from St. Leo University, and it was Tom, Tom Gillen, who's done a lot of work in human trafficking. And Tom was telling me about a project he was involved in called the role of healthcare providers in combating human trafficking. And what, what they did, this was in Orlando, Florida, and they were working with the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. What they wanted to find out is what kind of training healthcare personnel had in that area, because many times what happens is these guys bring these girls into these clinics and emergency rooms for treatment. They're, they're beaten, they're battered, they're diseased, they're pregnant, et cetera. So what they did, he got a, he got a grant, and what they did was they, they put out a survey, not surprisingly, and it's a survey involved about, about 1,000 people they got a response of about 560, 560 returns. And not surprisingly, what they also discovered was that very few of these people 
had any training in, in, their, in their medical training, which of course, obviously it's not a surprise. So what, what they did was they basically set up a training program for them, highly sophisticated questionnaires and so forth, in order to be certain that these people recognize human trafficking victims when they came in. Among, for example, among the things they did, and I know that Dr. Lee will be familiar with this, is they provided a checklist. And when I did my investigation book on sex trafficking, this appears to be pretty much a standard kind of kind of list. So they had, I'll give you just some samples, sex trafficking indicators. So when a young girl is brought into the emergency room, the, the personnel receiving them have some idea about what it is they're looking for. So for example, uh, Patient shares a scripted or inconsistency story history. Patient has no identification or documentation in their possession. Accompanying party insists on answering, interpreting for the patient, etc. They also have questions dealing with physical indicators, bruising, burning, cuts. Very, very specific kind of information that these folks have never had. They had a, have a two hour training session. And I said, this information is standard even for police officers that are conducting investigations and in interrogations. In the final analysis, what they also did was they, they Tom and his program, they developed a, a policy and procedure for, for healthcare workers. And so it's very, very much, very much applied. Uh, I've also had folks contribute for other areas of human trafficking, some from Africa. I've done, my, done some work myself in terms of training nuns, Catholic nuns in, in five African countries. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. But the one thing that is very, very clear is that it is multi-dimensional. You cannot, you cannot address the problem by simply dealing with one specialty. So that's my, you know, that's my little, little spiel about, the, about really having an umbrella that covers many disciplines uh, in, in terms of dealing with this problem. Because by the way, it is, it is global. There are, there are similarities between what goes on there are also dramatic differences. For example, uh, the, the country of Cambodia has, when, now when they talk about child sex trafficking, they're not talking about teenage girls, they're talking about girls that are four, five, six, and seven years of age. So it's a very, very different kind of problem. Fortunately, we don't have that problem in the United States. But it's, 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 all, it's, it's all driven by money. It's all about cash. And unless you've got people who come in contact with these individuals, on the front lines, the NGOs, the police officers, health healthcare workers, travel and so forth. You're not going to you're not going to get a handle on this. So that's that's my that's my spiel. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, John. I think uh, you saw the the uh, thing to send your questions to Amanda Roush because our chat wasn't working uh, as we had hoped. So Amanda. Uh, if we have some questions, if you could uh, please direct them to either Joan or Lenny, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see what we have. Great. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for sending any Q&As that you have. Um, this question is for Dr. Joan Reed. Why does Florida have such a big human trafficking problem? Um, great question. And so um, the research shows that there are specific community risk factors for human trafficking. And um, Florida just happens to have all or most of them. And so that is why we have such an issue. We have um, transient um, people coming into our state. So people on tourism, um, conferences, um, and then we also have military base, uh, military bases in our area. So anytime you have transient people coming in who may want to buy sex, you're going to have a problem with um, he, uh, with sex trafficking. We also have we're very um, We have um, a lot of uh, migrants who work in um, our fields who are being trafficked in labor, and so we just have all the issues, all the community issues that. Um, drive human trafficking we have. I also want to mention that just in the Tampa Bay area, we have a really large sex, um, you know, commercial sex industry, which pulls in tourists for um, sex tourism. We kind of don't call it that in America. We call it that when it's in Cambodia or Thailand, but it really is um, people are coming into Tampa with kind of sex on their mind and they don't ask for an ID to find out 
you know, is this person here willingly or not willingly? And so we just, we happen to have some, some of the things we love about Florida are also the things that uh, make it a really um, a problematic state. Great, thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, this question is for Dr. Torito. Um, how can USF best address the need for a multidisciplinary approach to human trafficking prevention? Yeah, USF really is a, is in a perfect a perfect position. Plus, you have the talent uh, on the faculty to address this. As 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 I see it, there really are two dimensions that USF can uh, can be involved in. The first one is the is the academic one. For example, right now I'm working with Dr. Carl Hawkins and and, and, and Dr. Kathleen Heidi uh, re relating to the creation of, if at all possible, an endowed professorship in the Department of Criminology in human trafficking. I think it would be really wonderful if we could have a you know internationally or nationally renowned scholar whose whose primary focus is on human trafficking, the the research that's involved is going on nationally, uh, a, a, along with scholarships, for PhD scholarships for young people, young men and women who might be interested in focusing their efforts in terms of the of, uh, of human trafficking. Plus, what what USF has the ability to do is there, there are lots of programs that are going on locally, whether it's law enforcement or NGOs, and, and the, the, the faculty, they have the skills to evaluate whether or not these programs are being successful. For example, you know, a lot of the police departments have what's known as a, as a John programs, where you go out there in their efforts to try to arrest men who are engaging in, in soliciting prostitution. There are some places that they have cameras in the area where prostitution occurs, etc. The question is, how effective are these? The university is in, a, is in a great position to, first of all, do the kind of research that Dr. Reed is doing, but in addition to apply the social science systematic way of evaluating the, the success of these programs. The, the, the second part of this really deals with a more of a, a training hands-on component, which, which I've, I've talked to some of you about in the past, and hopefully something will come to fruition. And that is a human trafficking institute which actually addresses the various agents we talked about to apply hands-on training, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's hotels, whether it's schools, whether it's the travel agency, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I, I think in, in many respects, university is really in a wonderful position, got a great reputation, a beautiful location. I think if we had a human trafficking institute, we would, we would attract students to come to this for all over the United States, especially in January, February, when it's freezing in other parts of the country. I, I, by the way, I say this because when I was director of the the, the uh, institute at St. Pete Junior College, the Police Institute for Training, uh, we used to attract people from all around the country. So USF is really, really in a great position. Of course, the uh, in the final analysis, it all comes down to uh, to funding, and uh, we're doing some work now and trying to get some endowed money and perhaps some scholarships or other things to to fund this. But uh, it, it really is a great, great location to have this done. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Reed. What is trauma bonding and how do you help kids who have trauma bonding with their traffickers? And so um, that was mentioned in uh, one of the slides as kind of the impact of um, the treatment and grooming of traffickers. And it doesn't only occur in human trafficking, it occurs in domestic violence, it occurs in child abuse, it occurs in kidnapping, um, it occurs in hostage situations. We kind of label it all a different way with each type of um, violence, but it all ends up with having a, the, there being a dysfunctional connection or bond between the person who's holding the victim's lives in their hands and, and the victim, they feel like they're, it, it's, I've done a little bit of research on it and um, it's even, it's really a biological survival response that you bond with that person who is holding your, your life in their hands, right? Um, and unfortunately there has, um, well, in, in a way, fortunately, the, the most recent um, trafficking in persons report that was put out by the US, um, that this year's trafficking report, brought um, trauma bonding to the forefront by writing a whole page about it and how important it is that we do research on trauma bonding 
And unfortunately, there's been very little research on the topic. In fact, um, there is no measure for trauma bonding. And so that's one of um, the new projects that I'm just beginning that I have just got a small bit of funding for to develop a measure. If we don't have a measure of something, it's really hard to identify it, to figure out what the um, indicators of it are. And especially, it's impossible really to know if your treatment for that is working. And so it's a really complex um, problem that we need to bring research to. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I actually have a question for both speakers. Um, is human trafficking dramatically increasing in the United States? For example, 40 years ago, did human trafficking exist and the police did not recognize? Who would you like to answer first? Lenny, why don't you go ahead and then yeah. we'll yeah. pass it over to Joe. By the way, human trafficking is nothing new in the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, you know, there's lots of, lots of literature out there that shows it, it's occurred the entire century. What what started to happen around 1989, 1990, to, one, one segment of it, is the, the Soviet Union fell. And when, when that occurred, it, pro, it provided opportunities for traffickers to start bringing in lots and lots of women from, from Eastern Europe. Now, tra trafficking had always existed in the United States, but it seems to have really exploded around the 1990s. And uh, so many of the women in recent years that have been brought into the United States have been from Eastern Europe, Russian, Ukrainian, Moldovan, et cetera. Uh, but we also have, for example, uh, uh, lots of them being trafficked in from Vietnam and also from, uh, from Korea. So the answer to your question is no, it's nothing new, uh, but it's for the first time, probably since about 2000 with the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, it's starting to get a lot of attention at the federal level it was initially, and now at the at the local level. Uh, and by the way, if you look at the history of trafficking for the 20th century, it's the same kind of, the same techniques are employed, the same times of exploitation, it, it, it driven by money, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's just been given a lot more attention. It probably, because of the ease of transportation and also getting across borders, it probably has increased but in terms of the, na the nature of the beast itself and the nature of the people involved and the victim exploitation, pretty much standard operating procedure with these with these people. Great answer, Dr. Torito. I don't have anything to add. That was perfect. May, may I say one more thing too, if I may just piggyback on what Joan was saying about the Stockholm Syndrome. From, from a police standpoint, the problem with the Stockholm Syndrome is also that, that when the officers attempt to engage or to rescue, many times the victims themselves are obstacles to the successful investigation. They, they, they bomb with their pimps. They're unwilling to cooperate. In some cases, for example, in other cases, not necessarily these, they will actually serve as you know, obstacles to the police officers being able to conduct their, uh, conduct their raids and, and rescue these women. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Great, thank you, Dr. Torito. Um, our last question um, is for Dr. Reed, and they're wondering if the, the TIP lab could develop a training component to assist communities to develop surveillance and intervention efforts to confront human trafficking in their jurisdictions. Yes. Of course, <laughs> that is one of our, you know, goals in spreading. One of the goals of the trafficking lab is to spread knowledge, right? And so, and and that would be through training, um, and any other um, avenues that we can provide it. Great, thank you both. Does that wrap up the Q and A? Yes, sir. Okay, at this point in time, I want, I want to thank Lee for making, Lee Burkow for making the introductions. Uh, and I want to especially thank uh, Joan and Lenny for their presentations and for responding to the questions and Amanda for presenting those questions to us. Uh, what Lenny and Joan have provided us today is a snippet of what the Department of Criminology is capable of doing. We have an extraordinary group of faculty doing very important work uh, that has you know, real life application and meaning, uh, meaningfulness behind it. 
Uh, and as such, um, you know, we need help. Uh, we can't do it on our own. We need the relationships we have with the agencies in, in, in the area and in the state and federally. But we also need help to help underwrite the cost of the work we're doing. Uh, we need to take a much more proactive role uh, with regard to our development efforts, and we need your help there. And with that, I'm going to ask Dean Sarovich if she would please uh, let us know how you can help us. Dean Sarovich? Well, thank you, John. Greetings, everyone. Uh, as John said, I'm Julie Sarovich, Dean of the College of Behavioral Community Sciences, and I want to thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful event. John, congratulations to you and your team. Uh, despite learning a new virtual platform to do this today, uh, everything went wonderfully. So thank you, your, your team uh, really pulled this one off. Uh, presenters, thank you for taking, for you know, giving us uh, the pleasure of learning more about the incredible work that you're doing and to share this important work with us. I, I wish you the best moving forward and invalid my support to assist you uh, in any way possible. This is very um, important. And as mentioned, it's just as important to be done here in the state of Florida. Honorees, congratulations for your well-deserved recognition. You make us all proud. Please continue to spread the good word of the University of South Florida Department of Criminology. Uh, we, we need to, to, to continue to, to build a momentum around this program that even though it's been here for a while, and it's, it's, just, it's growing um, in strength and popularity, and we need your assistance with that. Carl and Cynthia Hawkins, we so appreciate your continued support um, of this event and others. I so wish this is a second event that I haven't been able to be with you at, but your generosity is heartwarming and we appreciate everything that you do for the department from teaching to, to, uh, uh, to donations. So thank you for being here today, uh, Carl, and, and uh, taking a role in, in this event. We really do appreciate that and it was good seeing you. As you all know, this has been an unusual year for us. The department has continued to do, produce at unprecedented levels. Particularly, as John mentioned earlier, jumping four spots, four spots in U.S. News and World Report rankings. That is phenomenal. And it's been noted, and I've made sure that everyone who crosses my path knows it. Um, but what really impressed me, however, is the work that's being done behind the scenes to respond to and anticipate some of the fiscal challenges that we face at the university and in the departments. And there are many. While well, our budgets have been cut, and we don't know what's gonna happen next year, they're likely to be cut even more. Um, students have, increased, have um, faced increasing financial demands. Um, the, the, what the department has done is begin preparing to weather such a storm. And they did this by investing in two very programs early on that have been very helpful. First, they developed a cost recovery master's degree um, in cybercrime. This degree has been overwhelmingly successful, and in fact, they had the, they uh, expanded this year to offer an optional minor. The revenue that's generated from this program is kept within the unit and has, among other things, supported graduate students in teaching. This is very. This really helps grow our programs. Secondly, they have been active in developing professional trainings to offer to various agencies that will raise funds for student support, travel, and other needs that the department might have moving forward. Now, I mention all of this because it's really important to me that all the departments in the college help themselves first before asking for help from others. And criminology has been a rising star in that particular arena. However, it is not nearly enough and they need your fiscal support. Criminology remains the second largest major in the university. That, we have hundreds of students, and these students all face numerous challenges. Many have lost part-time jobs. They have suffered from the fact that their families have lost jobs. They've lost housing. Um, they've lost other resources that they had due to the pandemic. So besides that, their, their costs um, and their needs have, have increased, especially costs associated with new technology that they needed. Many of our students didn't have, didn't have computers, and now they have to have computers. They have to learn um, from home. And so these have been, this has been quite a burden um, on so many that they don't have internet access. It's just been, a, again, a tremendous burden. So I'm asking you today, please consider making a donation to a scholarship or other departmental fund of your choice. You can do this in memory of a departed faculty member, such as Dr. Mike Lieber, who we all know and, and love, 
or in honor of a favorite faculty member that you've worked with over the years. No gift is too small to not make a difference, and I mean a meaningful difference. Please do not hesitate to reach out to the College Development Officer, Holly Baran, or me directly. We are always happy to help, help direct you to a fund that you may be interested in, help maybe helping you if you want to establish a different fund. We learned today already uh, the work that could be done around human trafficking could be enhanced and increased with some additional support. So that's only one of many areas in criminology that we excel at and that again could use um, additional resources. So John, Thank you for inviting me to this event, and I'm always ready to help support such endeavors moving forward. And again, congratulations for a successful Hall of Fame. Thank you, Dean Sarovich. Your support is always welcomed. You are always in our corner, and we thank you for that. Um, I want to uh, reiterate the need for donor support. It is really uh, crucial. We want to be able to provide scholarships. We have uh, a doctoral program. We have four different master's programs. We have two different bachelor's programs. We have 1,300 undergraduate majors. We would love to be able to support more of them with scholarships if we can, uh, and we need your help to do so. Uh, in addition to scholarship help, we need to be able to support events like the Wall of Fame and our other speaker series, and we would like to be able to support better uh, the research and excuse me, the research efforts of our faculty. You've seen again an example today of the high quality stuff going on here. Uh, with regard to the Wall of Fame, uh, today's event, uh, you know I need to thank Stefan Fiku, who has been behind the scenes. Uh, he is in the Dean's office and he has helped us with all of our events. Likewise, uh, Amber Oderinde, uh, Kareen <coughs> Rodriguez, Amanda Rausch, Holly Barron and Christine Kruzaniak, uh, who have all helped uh, kind of be behind the scenes making this thing work. Uh, Teams is always an unfamiliar uh, playground for us, and, and, and we would be horribly incompetent uh, without their help. John and Lenny, uh, thank you for your presentations. It really do uh, inspire us, uh, show you the places we can go and the quality of work we can do. To Dwayne, Carl, and Lee, thank you for introducing our inductees and our speakers. Uh, always appreciated. Julie, again, thank you uh, for your support. To the inductees, again, I'd like to thank you and you know remind us <clears throat> and the faculty and staff and students at USF that uh, the alumni, the inductees to the Wall of Fame, uh, we, when we recognize you, it's our way of saying thanks back to you for all you do for the Department of Criminology uh, and helping us be successful. Uh, we need that reminder periodically and the Wall of Fame provides that opportunity. To the alumni and attendees to today's event, thank you uh, for, for going through with it. And to our donors, uh, you are a major source of lifeblood for this department. And with regard to the Wall of Fame, as you can see in the slide, we need to acknowledge the, uh, the donations that Carl and Cynthia Hawkins have repeatedly made for this program. Uh, and then I'd also like to acknowledge uh, support from Hyung Song, who is a 2017 PhD graduate and a 2020 inductee. James Hubble, who we met again today, uh, 2021 Wall of Fame inductee. Meg Ross with the uh, USFPD. Uh, 26 Wall of Fame inductee from our MACCHA program, Gold Investigations, and Mr. Martin uh, King III, all who have contributed to us. And then, of course, the uh, College of Behavioral Community Sciences at the University of South Florida. Uh, thank you all. We look forward to a face-to-face -face version of this in 2022, where we can shake hands, where we can put our arms around one another's shoulders, uh, meet face to face, enjoy some bad pasta and rubber chicken, uh, but at least be able to have time with one another. If things go as planned and we can get the donations, we would like also to be able to return next year with an evening event beforehand where we can have cocktails and hors d'oeuvres with our induct inductees uh, before the actual Wall of Fame ceremony. So to all, uh, thank you 
and have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.